Did you enjoy the singing? Now I'm excited. Thank you. Um, thank God for that uh, singing, uh, for the voices it gave us. Thank you, Brother Kennedy, for leading the song. It's good to see uh, your faces this morning. And uh, I think uh, Sister Chinese and Brother Joel, uh, you're the big Joe. <laughs> good morning. And I uh, saw so Brother Carlos. Luna, good morning, sir. And um, I saw Sister Marlene Richardson and Sister Wanda and uh, Melvin and Tricia. Good morning, everybody. And good morning, church. Are you excited? Yes, we are excited. Okay. Um, last week, um, we... Last week, we talked about what kills our joy, okay? So for the past weeks, we've been talking about joy and uh, how to sustain that joy. And last week, okay, we talked about what kills your joy. And the first thing that we talked about last week is about fear that kills your joy. And particularly, we talked about fear of death. And we talked about the solution, okay? Now, we will talk about another thing that kills your joy. In order for us to sustain your joy, you must know what kills your joy. And this morning, we are going to talk about one of my favorite. Okay? We're talking about one of the most deadly poison known to man that kills our joy. And uh, it is pride. Okay? One of my favorite. Because, you know, back home, we have this uh, joke about pride. You like pride? Yeah, I like my pride chicken. So that's why this is my, one of my favorite uh, <laughs> things to discuss about pride. Now, the Bible has so many things to talk about pride. It has so many things to say about pride. Now, let me tell you, number one, what pride is. Well, according to the Bible, according to Greek, okay, it is uh, huperipania, okay? the characteristic of one who, with a swollen estimate of his own powers or merits, looks down on others, even treats them with insolence and contempt. Now, on the other hand, pride or proud is hyperipanios. Hyper means over, beyond, excessive. And uh, panios or pineo, shine forth. So therefore, it means overshine, trying to be more what God directs, even trying to be more God. And that's what pride is all about. Okay. And that's where we get our word hyper, hyperactive, overactive. Okay. Now, they say that uh, pride is the uh, oldest and most common of sin, according to J.C. Ryle. Now, I am guessing that J.C. Ryle knew that pride indeed is the oldest of sin. And J.C. Ryle, he was an English um, evangelical bishop, and he read the Bible. He read the Bible. And he knew probably that pride is indeed the oldest sin of all. Now, do you know that pride is indeed the oldest of sin? You know that. Mm -hmm. And it is even actually older than Adam and Eve. Can you imagine? It is even older than Adam and Eve. Now, do you know why Satan was cast out of heaven? It is because of pride. It is because of pride. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17, this is in reference to Satan. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. You see, the problem with Satan or Lucifer is his pride. 
this arrogant heart. Okay. Now, what pride does, it, it kills our relationship. And number one, it kills your relationship with God. Okay, that's number one. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, we have here the account of the serpent and, and Eve. The serpent said, you will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, Satan is the father of all lies. Now, he planted that lie to Eve. Okay? And letting Eve know that he will become more greater than God so that Eve will fall from grace just like him. Okay? And we know what happened to the seed of lie that was planted to Eve. It gave birth to sin. It gave birth to the sin of pride. Now, they wanted to be like God and even greater than God. And that is what pride is. And they wanted to do away with God and be their own God. Now imagine, my dear brothers and sisters, Adam and Eve, they have a wonderful relationship with God. They have joy in the Garden of Eden. They have that privilege of talking, communing with God directly. Okay? And God gave them everything that they need. It was a kind of, actually it's a one-of-a-kind relationship. Now, because of pride, that relationship from God, it was cut off because of pride. Now, just like Satan was cast out of heaven, Adam and Eve, they too, were cast out from the Garden of Eden. Now, because of their pride, their joy of having a good life in the garden became a life of shame and became a life of hard work outside of the garden. Now, pride kills their wonderful relationship with God. You know, people don't want, they don't want to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because they think that they know better. We think that we know better and think that we can be saved without God. That we can save our own selves. That is pride. Now, their end is destruction. In, in Proverbs chapter 12, Proverbs 12, 15, fools think their own way is right. We think that my way that your way is right. That you don't need God. That's why, again, in Proverbs, it says, again, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. You know in your heart that you're going to heaven without God. But definitely, we are wrong. And it says, but the wise listen to others. Now, according to research, during the long history of Jerusalem, do you know that Jerusalem was destroyed twice? It was besieged many times, 20 times or more, and it was attacked more than 50 times. And it is recorded in history. And one of the causes of its downfall, its captivity, it's because of pride. Now, the following verse we're going to read gives reference to Jerusalem. In Isaiah chapter 3, verse 6, the Lord says, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, they are proud, walking with head, heads held high and seductive eyes. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 50, she was proud in reference to Jerusalem. She was proud and committed detestable sins, so I wipe her out as you have seen. You see, that pride destroys our relationship with God. All throughout the Bible, it is scattered there. Stories upon people and people and nations upon nations that was humbled and destroyed by God because of their pride. 
And the Bible is clear. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, that pride goes before destruction. A hot spirit before a fall. Now, not only pride kills our relationship with God, pride kills our relationship with our fellow. Now, with the word fellow, I mean it includes everybody. It includes your relationship with your husband, with your wife, with your family, with your friends, with your kids. Pride kills your relationship. You know, it was pride which caused Cain to kill Abel, his brother. Now, before Cain killed his brother Abel, it all started with pride and ended with pride in killing his brother Abel. Now, you can read Genesis chapter 4 about the accounts of Cain and Abel. Now, Cain and Abel, they both sacrificed to God. And it was Abel's sacrifice that was accepted by God. Now, how they knew what to sacrifice? The Bible is silent, actually. The Bible is silent about that, lo but that answer. But the logical answer is God instructed them on how. And we have a hint that God instructed them on how they would sacrifice. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, it says, You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Cain knew what was right, but he Refused to do it. He wanted to do it on his way, not God's way. That is pride. Okay? It's not the same thing, or pride is the same thing with Adam and Eve. Because Eve wanted her own way. When the serpent told her about that fruit, about being like God, Eve liked the idea. And, he want, and she wanted it on her way to be like God. Okay. So same thing with Cain and Abel. Cain wanted his own way, not God's way. Trying to be more than what God directs. And that is our meaning a while ago of what is pride. And then it ended up in pride. Now, do you know that the symptom of pride one of the symptoms of pride is envy. Okay. Envy. Because you wanted to be better than the other person. You always wanted to be one step higher than the next person. Okay. When God did not accept Cain's sacrifice, he became envious because he was lower than his brother. His sacrifice was not accepted. Okay, so inside Cain's heart, it rage, you know, it boils rage, hatred. So what Cain did is he killed Abel so that there will be no more comparison. There will be no more comparison. And, you know, I, I read this uh, observation by C.S. Lewis. He said, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich, proud or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer, being cleverer, or better-looking than Brother Kennedy. Now, if everyone else becomes equally rich, equally clever, equally good-looking as I am, there would be nothing to be proud about, right? It is the comparison that makes you proud. The pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition has gone, pride has gone. Now, the observation of C.S. Lewis is right. Pride is always about yourself being better than the other person sitting next to you. And that's what exactly Cain did. 
he eliminated competition so there can be no more comparison so that he will no longer be inferior to anybody. And he will be left at the top, being now the superior. And that is, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, is what pride is. Now, when God said to the wives to submit to their husband, God is telling you, my dear sisters, to cut away pride, to take away your pride. Now, men, when God tells us to love our wife, God is telling us to cut our pride. So, what God is telling us both is to take out pride in the relationship because we are now one, united with each other, and as such, God demands unity and not conformity. Because pride divides relationships. And when pride divides, it kills your joy. Pride divides even the church. Amen. True. Pride divides even all of us. Okay. Because when pride divides, it kills our joy. Now, let me tell you this. Through observation. You know, God did not take the female. He did not take Eve from man's head so as to rule man. God did not take Eve on man's foot so that man can trample, disrespect the woman. God took Eve from the ribs in between us, meaning equal. It means that man, we should love our wife and treat them as equal. And God took Eve under, uh, in our ribs, under our armpit. Okay. It's like, so to speak, beneath our wings. Man, we ought to care, protect the women. Oh, can I, did I hear amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. Now, now, here's the thing. Now, the women being under our wings, remember this, my dear brothers. My dear brothers, remember this. At the worst of our life, at the worst of your life, our wives will be the wind. Beneath our wings. Can I hear amen? Amen. Amen. That's why God demands unity in the relationship, and we can only achieve it by taking away pride. Take away that fried chicken and give it to me. <clears throat> now, in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. How have you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low to the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit and throne on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zapon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down at the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Now, do you notice the word or the letter? I. Okay. Remember, it was pride that led Satan's downfall because it is all about I. It is all about himself. It is all about me, myself, and I. Okay. And has nothing to do with God. Now, pride is pointing to yourself. It is about yourself. Now, you want to be stand out, to be seen by all. Now, notice the word pride. I think I have shared this with you before. What is in the middle? I. When pride gets into you, it is now everything about you. You become blind of the truth. Okay? You 
becomes now the truth. You become blind towards God. You now become the God of your own. Pride will not admit, it will not admit that you are wrong, even if you know you are wrong. Because I am proud, I am prideful. Notice what is in the middle of the word blind. It is I. Because all you see is yourself. Yourself. When you now become blind because of your foolish pride, it leads to what? It leads to sin. Now notice the word sin. What is in the middle? In the middle is I. It is always I. Pride is always I. Now, let me ask you this, my dear brothers and sisters. Do you know what is the common synonym of pride that we often use? What is the common synonym of pride? You have your pride. You have your ego. And ego means edging God out. You edge God out. You take away God. You kick God away from you. That is ego. I don't want God. I, have, I don't want anything to do with God. It's all about me, me, me. And rightly so, because of sin, in the sin of pride, we take away God. We edge out God. We take God in our life, and it is I that is the highlight and not God. Now, in the Bible, a, a quick uh, lesson about pride, edging God out, the king of Assyria, okay, Sennacherib, he ridiculed God, the God of Israel, and saying this against God. Just as the gods of the peoples of the other lands did not rescue their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not rescue his people from my hand. The king of Assyria, he edged God out. He ridiculed God and making a claim that he was way more powerful than God. And look at what happened as we continue in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Now, King Hezekiah, he prayed together with Isaiah the prophet. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fitting men and commanders in the cup of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, some of his sons, his very own flesh and blood, cut him down, killed him with the sword. The king of Assyria was put to shame by God because he thinks about himself and nothing more. He ridiculed God. He edged God out. His kingdom fell. He was killed by his own flesh and blood. Now, if you continue reading that, unfortunately, even Hezekiah, the king Hezekiah of Judah, he edged God out as well. And he became proud and God's wrath fell on him. Now, another classic example is the king Uzziah, or Uzziah. He became king at the age of 16. Then at the later part of his life, he edged God out in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. You see, if we take away God in your life, you will see, you will soon find yourself in trouble. And God, He detests the proud. He hates the proud. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. The other word used for detest is the word abomination. And it is a, a, a hard word, a heavy word. It means hatred. It means disgust. The Lord hated so much. Now look at the consequence of pride. Okay. The Lord said, they will not go unpunished. And he said, you be sure of that. Be sure of this, it means certain. Certain to happen. When you are proud and you edge God out, now be sure that God will punish you. 
be sure that God's punishment is right behind you. I did not say that. The Bible did. Okay. So make no mistake about it. So what is the solution? How do you kill pride? Live a Christ-centered life with humility. With humility. According to Augustine, pride was the root cause of the fall. Therefore, humility must be the first Christian discipline. And I believe it's true. I believe it's true. Humility, okay, humility focuses on God. Humility focuses on building relationships. Humility focus on, focuses on what is wrong and finding the solution to make it right. While pride focuses on who is wrong and finding the person to blame. That is pride. Pride is self-centered while humility is Christ-centered. Now, the Bible tells us the dynamics of humility. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. What actually Paul is saying to us, for all of us Christians, is that we think the same towards each other. Same mind, he said. Same love. One spirit, one mind, one love. It's all about the unity. Again, not conformity. As we continue, <clears throat> he said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but to each of you, to the interest of the other person. Now, Paul tells us what to do. How to think and act towards each other. Through humility, Paul is basically telling us not to think ill of others, but rather do what is for their best interest first, and then you be the last. Now, he said, let's have one mind. He said, let's have one spirit, one, one love. Okay? Now, if I will pursue and do what is better to you, and you will think the same. You will pursue and think and do what is better to me. We are actually lifting each other up. You get the point? We are actually lifting each other up. You know? In a relationship of pride, this is what is in the relationship of pride. It is all about trying to be better than the other person. You pull each other down. You bite each other. You want to, you know, you tear each other apart. That is what pride is. You try to outdo each other by destroying one another. I'm better than you. And the other person will tell you, I'm better than you. Okay? That is what pride is. Okay? Now, you are both losers in pride. In pride, there are no winners, only losers. But in humility, there are no losers. In humility, if you will understand the concept of what Paul is trying to say here, there are no losers in humility. There are only winners. Because you both exhaust everything. You will do everything in making each other better. I think better for Brother Kennedy. And he thinks the same for me. And how can we lose? How can we lose? Okay. If we all just learn this, life will be a lot easier and we will have a happier relationship. Okay. If we outdo one another in love, in honor, how can you be losers with that? How can you lose with that? If I'm thinking what is better to bother people and he is thinking the same to me, how can we lose? How can we lose? In James chapter 4, verse 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So, humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, the Lord will continue to oppose you until we learn to be humble. Until you learn to bow down to him, he will continue to oppose you. 
Now, the solution for our pride is to follow Christ's example of humility. Now, think again of joy. Again, what is the meaning of J-O-Y? Jesus, others, and you. That is humility, my dear brothers and sisters. If you think Jesus first, you think others second, and you think about yourself last. If others are doing the same, then life will be easier. Life will be more joyful. We will all be smiling and happy. The antidote against pride is to live a Christ-centered life in humility. Now, as you now hear his words, please do not harden your heart. By accepting Christ into your life, you humble yourself in front of the Almighty. Now, to all of you who have not accepted the Lord, and to all those who are in Zoom, why not come today? As we sing the song of invitation, we are inviting you to come forward and accept our Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. You know, let the congregation help you. Let the elders help you as you search for truth. It is our prayer, you know, that you will find the importance of God in your life and continue to be humble with him. May God bless us all. Shall we stand as Brother Kennedy leads us in the song of invitation?